the thing that I think is, is a true illusion is that consciousness comes first. And consciousness is, is again wrapped up in this idea of a self. So that there's this self that's kind of floating free from the material world somehow and is initiating everything that happens. And I think that is a, is, is a false view. And we feel that consciousness is behind our willed actions, when in fact there's a lot of neuroscience to suggest that it's, it's actually the reverse, that it's, that it's at the end, that all of this processing happens, a decision gets made, and then we're kind of the last to know. This false sense of a self is actually where a lot of human suffering comes from. Somehow, we, I mean, we have this very strong intuition that there is a me that is separate from the brain processing. What is, would you say, your most sort of awe-inspiring insight into the human mind? Hmm. I think the, just the simple insight that consciousness is as mysterious as it turns out to be it is, to me, the most awe-inspiring piece. And it's really the reason I wrote the book. I mean, there are many reasons, but, but the main reason was really um, to share this sense of inspiration and awe at just how mysterious consciousness is. Um, and many people actually don't realize that it's one of the great enduring mysteries. So we're all kind of familiar with looking out into the cosmos and wondering about black holes in the beginning of the universe. Um, and is there life you know, on other planets? And, and these things are, are naturally awe-inspiring. Um, and many people don't realize actually that, that consciousness is on, in some ways on equal footing with these, these other great mysteries. Um, but the difference is it's here with us in every moment. And so th there's actually this great mystery, this great awe-inspiring mystery that's with us I in every moment kind of to, to be reveled at and to. Neuroscience has made so much progress that I think most people think some scientist understands it or if they don't quite understand it, they'll understand it soon. Mm. Um, and I think part of it is just that it's, it's kind of something we take for granted, I think we have always assumed, um, I think, you know, in, in modern times, since we've had modern science, we've always assumed that um, consciousness is analogous to something like a light bulb, where um, it seems miraculous to flip a switch and, and suddenly a room is flooded with light. Um, but, but once you understand the details, once you understand electricity um, and the mechanics of a light bulb, um, it's something you can understand. It's not, it's not really mysterious. Mm. Um, and I think people, a lot of people have assumed that consciousness is analogous to that. And there, are, I think there are many reasons why that, that analogy actually doesn't hold. So the way I'm using the word consciousness, people use the word in, in a variety of ways. And often it, it makes it a confusing term. Um, and actually, the, the best term I think is, is experience to really point to the most fundamental sense of consciousness. So consciousness simply being experience, whether... Um, there is something that it's like to be a collection of atoms in the universe. So we, we often forget that, that um, it's literally true that we are stardust. We are made of the same ingredients of, of everything else in the universe. And there's this magical fact that when matter gets configured in, in a certain way, it lights up from the inside, that suddenly there's something that it's like to be that matter. And so many people use the word consciousness to kind of talk about higher order um, reasoning, um, self-awareness, things like that. But I'm using it in the, most, in the most fundamental sense, simply having an experience, simply there's something it's like, to use Thomas Nagel's definition, he, he wrote a famous essay called What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And in that essay, he, he says, um, an organism is conscious if there's something that it's like to be that organism. And some people have a hard time with that terminology, but for me, that really kind of gets, gets to the core of, of this simple definition of consciousness and why, why it's mysterious. It's fascinating that we have this intuition somehow that this isn't the case, but of course we know that our experience, our conscious experience in this moment, and all of the content that's flooding in through this experience is a result of brain processing. And if you change the brain, the experience changes, the thoughts change, the feelings change. It's, it's, um, it's all correlated. I think people also experience a lot of relief from this idea that they are responsible for all of that processing too. And so this gets into, um, when, when, I, when I talk about these examples in my book, I'm, I'm specifically talking about two illusions that I think inform our view of consciousness, which is why I spend a lot of time on them. And one is this illusion of conscious will. 
um, and one is the illusion of being a self. This false sense of a self is actually where a lot of human suffering comes from. And part of it is, is what I was just getting at, which is that we have this idea that, you know, even though we understand that we're brain processing, you know, at bottom, somehow we, I mean, we have this very strong intuition that there is a me that is separate from the brain processing. And there can be a lot of um, guilt and regret and, and things like this that come about because of kind of a false way of viewing um, what in fact we are and what our conscious experience is. So the, the notion of this, this self that somehow can override whatever the brain is doing or you know, make, make decisions somehow, I mean, it's funny, it's an incoherent idea, but we all have it very strongly and very we kind strongly. of assume it's there. Um, it's related to the notion of conscious will. I like to distinguish conscious will from free will, only because free will, um, by my definition, is m a much more complex thing. And I, I, we could actually talk for a long time and I could explain why I think there's not much freedom in free will. <laughs> um, but that free will is, is something that, in some sense, I can agree that the, the brain has. It's, it's a complex processing system. It's responding to all kinds of stimuli and ideas and can, can change and mutate and, and, and make decisions as a processing device, for lack of a better word. Conscious will is the idea that consciousness is the thing that is the will, that consciousness is the will. So we have, again, it's related to, to these questions that I, that I ask in the beginning of my book, is consciousness doing something? And we feel that consciousness is behind our willed actions, when in fact there's a lot of neuroscience to suggest that it's, it's actually the reverse, that it's, that it's at the end, that all of this processing happens, a decision gets made, and then we're kind of the last to know. So the brain is not in any way a closed system. Um, just because our conscious experience is of what the brain is doing doesn't mean at all that the brain is not influenced by ideas. And, you know, it, it, and even in physical terms, as you said, you can, you can have a brain tumor that will dramatically alter what your conscious experience is. Um, but more importantly, for, for this type of discussion, you know, if I yelled and said, oh, that, that beam is about to fall on you, that's an idea that just gets communicated through language that suddenly changes your brain. So your brain is, is a physical system, but my words, my ideas get in and it completely changes the structure of your brain so much that you're going to jump up. Right? Like I could get you to jump up just by transferring that information. The thing that I think is, is a true illusion is that consciousness comes first. And consciousness is, is again wrapped up in this idea of a self. So that there's this self that's kind of floating free from the material world somehow and is initiating everything that happens. And I think that is a, is, is a false view. The focus of my book, which is at its core challenging our intuitions. And challenging intuitions is a very important part of the scientific process. I think it's wonderful for human beings to contemplate in the same way that it's good for us to contemplate all of the mysteries. I, I also think that mysteries are, are really uniting. When all of humanity is facing something that they don't understand, I actually think there's something really beautiful about that and it really connects us in, in a way. Anytime we gain new knowledge that's, that's groundbreaking, there always seems to be this period of time where we're wrestling with our intuitions um, in everything from when we finally understood that the earth is a sphere and not flat, to understanding the germ theory of disease, to understanding that space and time are warped by gravity. These are all things that when we discover them, when we encounter them, they're so counterintuitive. There's always this period of time when scientists are kind of wrestling with their intuitions before they can make progress. Because it, when things are so counter to our intuitions, we have a hard time accepting them. And so you kind of have to be face the same evidence over and over again and then kind of reshape your intuitions in order to think about the world in this new way so that the science mm -hmm. can progress. And so I think we're at a place like that with consciousness right now. So I think it's, it's really important for us to be challenging our intuitions about consciousness. Mm -hmm.